Hey guys, so we're gonna load up the Jeep for the expedition through central Pennsylvania for the BDR. What we're gonna be doing is first I have to install my AEV high lift jack that goes on the tire carrier. Then I gotta install a uh, floor mat that I made for the rear cargo area that holds the fridge in, uh, in a secure location. I use the four cargo tie down bolts, take those out and um, replace them with 10 millimeter screws. Then, the last thing I have to do is in the back seat over the leather, I have canvas back uh, seat covers that uh, that clip on to the seat headrests. So that's what I have to do to install. And then after that, it's just loading everything up. When you load up the Jeep, optimally, you want to put as much weight in the center of the vehicle for center balance reasons. Um, unfortunately, with the way I have it configured with my fridges in the back, um, I don't have that option. The one uh, one big benefit of the Jeep is the tailgate opens to the left, and the it's on the opposite side. So my fridge is on the opposite side of my fuel tank, so it kind of offsets a little bit of the weight because the ARB 54 fridge does weigh a little bit of weight. So, and then on the other side of the fridge, you'll see I have all my front runner gear. The other way I set up my Jeep. Uh, for from an organizational standpoint is I pretty much have all my camping gear in the back seat I'll put my tent on the floor my sleeping bag on the floor and my cot on the floor on the seat I'll put all my kitchen my in a front runner case I have all my kitchen gear and then I have a plastic uh, Rubbermaid tote that's where I put all my uh, non-perishable foods chips and whatnot um, in the cargo area, I have my fridge, obviously, and that's where I put my, my tools and recovery gear. I, In the event of an emergency or of a recovery, I don't want to have to be going in and out of the vehicle, opening multiple doors and all that type of stuff. I want all my stuff in a central location where everybody knows. All right, guys, so here we are. We're in the office. We're uh, just about to be leaving for the Pennsylvania BDR. Going to be working on my uh, grocery list. Have to, I'm going to be doing all the grocery shopping for the five of us. So, um, been working for the past couple months on brainstorming ideas and testing some uh, cooking out with uh, using my Camp Chef stove and the gear I have in the Jeep, trying to make it uh, healthy, nutritious, fulfilling, and for me, most importantly, is easy cleanup. Uh, so, what I've done is I've created a, uh, a list here of all the camp food menus that I've come up with so far, um, getting ideas from Mount State Overland and Venture 4x4. Chris, I've come up with uh, small little pizzas. Uh, we did that in the on our trip to New River Gorge, tested a bunch of them out. We made about four or five pizzas, and they're individual pizzas. So figured out like what temperature this to use on the griddle and if you have to cover it or not. We got that. Um, fetus was really good. Um, we used a little too much water, a little too much meat, um, but they worked out really well. Uh, nice, easy cleanup. Used the uh, uh, cast iron skillet. Worked really well. Um, pasta, that's a pretty simple, easy meal. Just have to boil some water, bring uh, some pasta sauce, and if we want some meatballs or whatnot, that's a pretty easy uh, thing. And it, these are all easy cleanup. I'm trying not to... Uh, get the griddle real greasy using real greasy foods and whatnot like bacon and sausage hamburgers and whatnot if i had the opportunity to cook on a scottle or on an open fire pit with a you know a little grate that flips over and out um those are great ideas for that type of stuff but uh like hamburgers and sausage but on a little camp chef grill, the amount of grease it creates and all that, it's more of a headache. We'll spend more time cleaning the griddle than it is. Um, and the one thing we just came up with was uh, barbecue chicken and potatoes. And we're gonna use, you have to kind of make them one at a time or two at a time, and it's just gonna be inside um, foil. So you put everything in there, throw them on the, uh, on the stove top, on the griddle, and it's gonna be good. One thing we do have to come up with is uh, breakfast and lunch. We're not going to be pulling the stoves out and cooking big breakfasts um, just so we can get going in the morning. So we're going to be doing like pop tarts or breakfast bars and whatnot. And then for lunch, 
keep it real simple. It's just gonna be uh, lunch meat on hoagie buns with you know mustard and whatnot. So um, I have to think step by step, and we'll be going to the going to the grocery store, and uh, you'll be going to the grocery store with me, and we're gonna see what we need to do. All right, we're at the grocery store. Got grocery grocery uh, buggy full of all the food we're gonna use. We got uh, some three pounds of taco meat, some chicken, potatoes, cheese. And then over here, I uh, got some stuff for our house. And then we also have uh, my breakfast foods, some fruit. So we're gonna be all set for this, uh, for the Pennsylvania BDR. So uh, now off to the checkout counter. So we're outside the uh, grocery store here, just emptying out the, uh, the groceries. Because we're leaving tomorrow morning, um, the fridge is going to be running all night. So I put uh, what we have here so far in the fridge. I'll reorganize it when I get home because I got to put some water and sodas in there. And then in my non-perishables, I uh, just loaded all that up. Got to throw a couple extra things in there that are on the list that I have at my house. Um, just a thing of point, you know, something I've learned over time. I always save the... Uh, the grocery the plastic grocery bags i carry big trash bags with me but uh if you're working with something small and you greasy or whatever it's just nice to have some extra trash bags you never have enough so uh jeep's all loaded up for the most part gotta throw uh, some personal stuff in and uh hitting the road for uh 4 30 tomorrow morning 4 35 a.m hitting the road so all right we'll be on the road tomorrow look forward to it all right it's 4 51 just about to hit the road I had the Jeep all packed up last night. I plugged the fridge into the uh, house just so it wouldn't uh, kill my battery because it had to uh, warm up. Just putting all the food in there overnight brought the uh, internal temperature a little up. Putting water and soda and all that, so I had to uh, bring the. Uh, <coughs> I won't have a dead battery in the morning. 4:52, hitting the road. First stop is a uh, rest area on the Ohio Turnpike. We're gonna meet up with D and TJ and his kids. So uh, let's get going. The abandoned Pennsylvania Turnpike is the common name of a 13 mile stretch of the Pennsylvania Turnpike that was bypassed in 1968 when a modern stretch opened to ease traffic congestion in the tunnels. In this case, the Sidling Hill Tunnel and the Rays Hill Tunnel were bypassed as was one of the Turnpike's travel plazas. The bypass is located just east of the heavily congested Breezewood Interchange for Interstate I-70 eastbound at what is now I-76 exit 161, the section of Turnpike that was once part of the South Pennsylvania Railroad. When the Pennsylvania Turnpike opened in 1940, it was known as the Highway Tunnel because it traversed seven tunnels from east to west, Blue Mountain, Catani, Tuscarora, Sidling Hill, Rays Hill, Allegheny, and Laurel Hill. There was one tunnel through each mountain, and the highway was re reduced to a single lane in each direction through the tunnels. These tunnels were originally built as part of the South Pennsylvania Railroad. One short tunnel was bypassed during the original construction of the turnpike. By the late 1950s, the turnpike was so heavily used that traffic congestion demanded expansions because bottlenecks at the two-lane tunnels of the Pennsylvania Turnpike became major problems to traffic jams forced at each tunnel especially during the summer. The Pennsylvania Turnpike Condi Commission conducted studies on either expanding or bypassing the tunnels. In 1959, four senators urged the state officials to work with the Turnpike Commission to study ways to reducing the traffic jams. That year, the commission began studies aimed at re resolving the traffic jams at Laurel Hill and Allegheny Mountain Tunnels. Studies for the other tunnels followed. At the conclusion of the studies, the Turnpike Commission planned to make the entire turnpike four lanes by either adding a second tube at the tunnels or bypassing them. The new and upgrade tunnel tubes would feature white tiles, fluorescent lights, and upgraded ventilation. The Turnpike Commission announced plans to build a second bore of the Allegheny Mountain Tunnel and a four-lane four bypass of the Laurel Hill Tunnel in 1960. A bypass was planned for the Laurel Hill Tunnel because traffic would be more quickly and less expensively relieved than it would be by boring another tunnel. In 1962, the Turnpike Commission approved these two projects. That August, $25 million in bonds were sold to finance the two projects. The Laurel Hill Tunnel was bypassed using a deep cut to the north, and it would feature a wide median 
truck climbing lanes and a 145 foot uh, deep cut into the mountain. Groundbreaking, groundbreaking for the new alignment took place on September 6, 1962. This bypass opened to traffic on October 30, 1964 at a cost of $7.5 million. Work on the boring of the South Pennsylvania Railroad Tunnel was considered, but again rejected because of its uh, poor condition. On March 15, 1965, the new tube opened to traffic after which the original tube was closed to allow updates to be made. The reopening in August 25, 1966, the construction of the second tube at Allegheny Mountain cost $12 million. The turnpike bypass of Rays Hill and Sidling Hill tunnels opened to traffic on November 6, 26, 1968. The Sidling Hill and Ray Hill tunnels were bypassed by a 13-mile new highway, as was the Coe Valley Travel Plaza, which was located on the westbound side of the eastern portal of the Sidling Hill Tunnel. Instead, a new Sidling Hill Travel Plaza was built to cater for travelers in both directions. Today, the Bandon Turnpike, as it is commonly known, is a popular tourist attraction. The Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission sold the, most of the property to the Southern Alleghenies Conservatory for $1 in 2001. The property is managed by Friends of the Pike to Bike, a coalition of nonprofit groups, to eventually convert the stretches into a bike trail. The property is officially closed to the public and no motor vehicles are allowed to travel on the property, but bicycle riders are free to use it at their own risk. The trail requires helmets and lights because the stretches of parts of the former right-of-way of the South Pennsylvania Railroad that was never completed but later formed the basis of the mainline, mainline turnpike. This makes Pike to Bike officially a rail trail. The Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission still owns a stretch of about a quarter mile on the west side and 3.5 miles east of for maintenance purposes. The tunnel's entrance had deteriorated due to vandalism and their sign boards were taken sometime between 1981 and 1999. However, the tunnel structure is still, still sound despite not having been maintained for decades. A business plan and feasible study was completed by Gannett Fleming in 2005. It proposed various ideas to make the trail as accessible and possible for cyclists, hikers, inline skaters, and uh, equestrians. As of November 2007, the trail is in the process of changing ownership to Bedford County. This is in response to the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation Natural Resources needs for a government body to own the trail before it can give out grants. The Friends to Bike will continue to run and oversee the trails. In the early 1970s, the emission levels of unleaded gasoline were tested in the Rays Hill Tunnel. A Plymouth satellite was used as a test vehicle. The Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission and PennDOT used the highway to train maintenance workers as well for the testing of rumble strips. There has also been numerous military uses for the highway. The tunnels were considered a, as a storage area for weapons as they were open highway for aircraft. The military also used the highways for training soldiers for Iraq in early 2000s and even after the highways were sold to Southern Allegheny's Conservatory the site of the former Co Valley Travel Plaza was used as a shooting range for the Pennsylvania State Police since the Southern Allegheny's Conservatory bought the property. The site has not been used as a shooting range, although warning signs are still posted in the area. In 2008, the highway was used for the filming of the movie The Road, starring Vingo Martinson. The studies mainly restored the exterior of the eastern portal of the Rays Hill Tunnel when used for filming.